Where are we right now, John? Well, we're right next to something that reminds me of my granddaughter, Charlotte Free, who's the top model in the world, runway model now. And next to this store, which reminds me of my other granddaughter, Adelaide, who's almost seven, and this is her favorite TV show, is Square Bob Sponge Pants. Oh no, <laughs> SpongeBob Square Pants. I've learned to love it too. We watch it together. So everything we react to everything differently, you know, which is fantastic. But I just wish photographers would just allow themselves to shoot from their heart, from their personal vision. Man, what I've seen in my classes when the students start doing that, it's unbelievable how good it is and how wonderful it is to watch these people realize that they're producing good work. It's an exhilaration, like I've mentioned before. It's exciting and you, and you can help people achieve that. And when you do that, you, everybody feels great. No exaggeration here. How can I exaggerate when you can look at the work of Robert Frank, Gene Smith, Cartier-Bresson and not feel something fantastic? That's proof of what I'm telling you here. You're no different than Robert Frank or Cartier-Bresson. I'll tell you the only difference is most photographers between, the difference between most photographers and Cartier-Bresson is that Cartier-Bresson worked harder than anybody else. He put more of his life into what he was doing than anybody else I've ever seen. His greatness is unbelievable. You can't touch the guy. And he gave it to us, and he also took the time to write it down and tell us how to do it. So we got to hold him up on a pedestal. We're all standing on his shoulders. That's what he said. And he says we all owe it to Kirtesh. <laughs> he says what we're doing now, Kirtesh did before. What a wonderful, humble man. What a wonderful thing he must have felt looking at all his pictures and the effect that it had on us. A great man. You know, I started this photography at a very terrible time in my life. I was in the Marine Corps in the Far East. It wasn't nice. It was terrible. It was depressing. It was like being in prison. And the camera gave me an out, even in that horrible place and time. The camera gave me an out. And I went down to the Air Force Base on Okinawa and taught myself how to print. They gave me the chemicals and they gave me the paper. It was funny. I signed in. You have to sign in. I signed in at the time I signed in. And years later, I went back home for a high school reunion. And my buddy at the high school reunion says, hey, John, he says, I just missed you a few years ago in Okinawa. He says, you signed in five minutes after I signed in at the same place, and we missed each other. It's the magic of what photography could bring people to. I photographed my son's first breath of life in 1971, May 22nd. Later, when he became an adult and a photographer, I gave him that very same camera. And he photographed his daughter's first breath with that camera. That's a fact. That's wonderful. How much better could it be to have children like that? He's my best friend. We go everywhere together. We photograph together. He's 41 years old now. This is my life. The older I get, the better it gets. The better my photography has gotten. But the smile helps. If you keep smiling, you're getting far less trouble with the camera in the street. Your enthusiasm for the camera and for what you're doing is infectious. And it disarms a lot of people. 
Yeah, it's my new hobby. I'm taking a, I'm, I'm studying photography. Let me grab your shot here. What do you, have I got that set right? Hey, this is great. You should try it. You know, it's all about that. To me, if there's a style of working, that's me. I, I try to be invisible, but if I'm noticed, I want them to think I'm harmless. I'm not out to hurt anybody. If they knew what I was out to do, I told you before, they would want to hug me, because I'm trying to lift everybody up. That's what a good photograph will do. That's what Passant did for me and Gene Smith. <laughs> 13 invasions of the Marines in World War II. Got to affect you some way. He cried a lot after that. But he made some of the greatest pictures of combat and of the terrible strife of war that I've ever seen. How can you ask a civilian, a young civilian like him with poor eyesight, to go on 13 invasions with the Marines in World War II? No Marine has ever gone on that many invasions. They go on one or two, maybe. He went on 13, and like 25 different aircraft operations off aircraft carriers. He rode in the second seat and photographed all that. What's that got to do to the guy? And he, gets, he survived World War II and goes out and made these wonderful photo essays. Nurse Midwife, Albert Schweitzer, Spanish Village. They're all there. They're all there for us to see. Gene's gone. I hope he's happy. He knows what he did. He knows what he gave us. But it was real tough for him. But that's it. He gave it all to us. Good morning. Yeah. All this talking and I'm not doing any work, huh? Without photographing at close range, I'll give you a tip. I love this one. The whole thing in photography is getting close. You know, there's a story. You take your pictures to the editor of Time Magazine, the photo editor of Time Magazine. He's sitting at his desk, and you go in there with a load of pictures, and he gives you five minutes. And he looks at your pictures. He says, he's not close enough. What, what do you mean? You're not close enough. That's what it is. What did Kappa say? You're not you're, close enough, your pictures your, aren't good. Whatever. If, you're, if, you're, if your pictures aren't good, good enough, you're... Like, yeah, if your pictures aren't good, good enough, then you're, you're, not, close you're not close enough. No, that's what it is. <laughs> and why aren't you close enough? Because you're afraid. Come on. Do this test, my personal test. What happened? Pigeons? Unless 
<laughs> Unless, but getting back to my tip point, see? You're never close enough. You're not close enough because you're afraid, and then you cop out by saying, I don't want to invade their privacy and all this crap. So take my test. Make believe. What if I was completely invisible? No one could see me or hear me or feel me or smell me or whatever. Now, how close would I get? Oh, sure, I'd get right up next to the guy. Well, then you got a problem. But to help you alleviate the problem, let me give you my 20 degrees shift idea. When you're photographing something, don't face it. Turn yourself 20 degrees or whatever, 20 degrees away from the subject and make believe you're photographing something else. That way it alleviates the pressure on the subject that you're photographing. So if I want to photograph that truck and it's a person, if I'm interested in something over there, I can pre-focus. It's not zone focusing. It's pre-focusing on something that's the same distance away as the subject. And you turn, you make the shot, you keep turning, you fake a couple of shots here and you walk away. But at least you didn't put the subject on the spot and make him feel bad about someone sneaking up and stealing his picture or a stranger he doesn't know. So the 20 degree shift works real good. Never face your subject. I know a lot of people will probably want to argue with me. What's this guy, crazy? He told me not to look at the subject? Ooh, that's crazy. No, it's not. Works for me. I wouldn't tell you about it if it didn't work for me. I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to help photography. That makes me feel good. Okay, here comes a man with a cane and we got the fence. It's still not enough. It's an easy shot. You see it coming. But we need something else. Now, what about someone working in that truck? No. It's too dark in that truck, it won't come out. So we'll leave this guy alone. Maybe we can get him going that way, behind him. But no, I don't see anything else that goes with it. Maybe because I'm limited in my brain power. But like I said, I'd rather not take a shot if it's gonna be a, a you know, a so-so shot. And I don't wanna be misunderstood. You don't photograph the fat lady. You're not making a joke out of this. You don't make things that will hurt other people in the process. Sean didn't. You're too good for that. That's what, that's what street photography is. It's incredibly difficult. But that's what makes it so valuable. Come on. You're not gonna photograph flamingos and palm trees. There's too many important things to do with the human animal. That's what we need to dwell on. And everybody has the power. You ask somebody what they want. Oh, I want $20 million. Yeah, what are you going to do with it? You, know. you want power. Everybody wants to have some kind of a power. But it's a good power. It's an uplifting power. It's a helpful power. Something you cultivate in your heart. The main thing is to feel good about yourself. How do you do that? That's why I said, you know, when it comes to the scaffolding, that's the whole point. How they build the scaffolding. What a crazy place, huh? LA? Come on out to LA. We'll work together. There's always something fantastic going on anywhere. What you got going over here?
right at that when I pressed it a couple of seconds ago. Must have been my fault. Maybe, did you wind it? Yeah, yeah I thought I did. Well, yeah, but it might, might not have wound it enough. Yeah. But it's a horrible feeling when that happens, when, when you want it to go off and it doesn't go off. Oh. But it's usually always my fault. Batteries wasn't all the way cocked. I wasn't paying attention. Anything that happens to the photographer, you have to accept that it's always your fault. That's what I do. I, it makes me feel better if I can accept that. Oh, somebody got in my way. No, it's your fault. You didn't see him coming. Well, yeah, but he put his hand. Yeah, it's your fault. You didn't see it happening. Your fault. If we can accept that, you feel a lot better about what you're doing. I mean, you've got to realize how hard this is to do. So hard. Your chances of getting a shot, you know. I've said this before. If you get one shot out of three rolls of film, say out of 100 shots, if you get one shot out of 100 shots, which is good for most photographers, that's still 99% failure. <laughs> Why are you failing so much? That's crazy. I don't know. Why did you take the picture? It's no good. Why did you take it? Keeps me up at night. Why did I take it? Oh, maybe it'll come out. No, it's not going to come out. Oh, Brisson did the same thing. What was his average, you know? Who knows? Sometimes those are secrets. We never know how many shots he made to get one. In his book, Scrapbook, which is fantastic, it shows a lot of his famous shots. He made, he made six or seven shots and got the one good one. That's fine. But you don't put the camera on automatic and just keep firing it off. That's a disgrace to you and photography. No guessing here. But people are afraid to put everything they got into it sometimes with the fear that they'll fail. They'll fail. They put everything they possibly have and they still fail. That makes them feel bad. No, no, no. I don't feel that way. This is so terribly hard. But you got to sweat out each shot. You've got to try real hard on each shot. And if you don't, they're not, they're not going to come out. And if it's an accident, then you can't take credit for it. You know, you know in your heart when it's an accident. You can still use it, but you got to admit that it was an accident. You don't have to say that on the photograph, but in your heart, you know it was an accident. And if it was good, fine, go with it. Still use it. Wonderful. Glad that it works for other people. But just laugh to yourself and say, yeah, I screwed up, but it still came out. Thank you. That's about it, you know? Look at that over there, I wish I was closer. Man raising the little kid over his head. There's always a shot, something like that. <laughs> Celebration of life, father and son. Yikes, how deep does it go? How good can you make it? How quick can you be? You gotta hook the heart to the camera, but you gotta be good with the camera. You gotta be good mechanically. You gotta go out and practice every day. In the backyard, how long does it take you to focus on that trash can? What about that framing? It was crooked when you push the button. You don't have to have film in the camera. But you gotta practice. That's the difference between most photographers and an Olympic athlete. They're practicing eight, ten hours a day and you're not. You're doing nothing. And when you get there and a shot comes and it's a great situation, boom, you missed it. No one sees you missing it. There's no pressure on you. No one knows you just blew it. But they do when an athlete blows it. They're off the team. So you got to have some pressure, a lot of pressure. That's why sometimes a professional photographer gets better. He's really paying attention if he's getting paid. He doesn't want to lose his job. But the average slap-happy photographer walking down the street, no one sees him screwing up. So it's OK. And then. He makes the big mistake of showing all his boring pictures to his close friends. And the close friends are bored to death by the pictures, but they say, oh, isn't that beautiful? Because they're your friend. And you go away thinking that you did something great. Baloney, it's crap. Leave your friends alone. Jesus, don't bore them to death with that crap you're making. You're making crap because you're guessing and you're not working hard enough. Forget it.
Maybe there's something through the window there. Those castles, they look like New York castles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Over there, this side. Maybe we should go over there. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. They, they got the hats like New York cops. You know? Yeah. That was great in New York when the other cops slapped the other cop in the face. <laughs> Only in New York would they do something like that, right? They slap you in the face. <laughs> I told him that joke. He said his grandfather would have liked that joke. I'm not going to repeat it. You know? I got some discretion, you know. But I can be from New York, you know, a lot of people from New York, they talk like this, you know, they don't mean it, but, you know, that's where they, you know, they're good people, you know, but they're tough. Maybe if you talk to the cops like you're from New York, you get more respect. What do you think? <laughs> you know, this guy's going to throw that kid up again, I'm going to get the shot with the cops. With the cops. Well, here's the 20, the 20 degree shift. Is that working out? 